I get to work with this man, and there's no way I'm not going to be able to say wonderful things about him. So just give me a minute, okay? I am. You promise only a minute. Only a minute. I went through Hurricane Andrew. How many did? Okay, more of you didn't. He was a senator at the time. State was a mess, and only three people in the entire 160-person legislature understood insurance. And you're going to hear today his memory of that and how he and two others put this state on the right track. And as a consultant, and I will say this to you, and I've said it to you before, he is the smartest CEO in the room, and he tries very diligently to come up with good public policy, even when it doesn't make his company any money. He testifies in the Senate, takes his own time to do that. He will talk to me on a Sunday morning when I can't quite get something, and he takes great time in creating fabulous presentation slides, and he writes, which is a dying art in our industry. So without further ado, I hand you Locke Burt. <laughs> What you've heard today is Florida's different. Um, it's different in a lot of ways. And what my job is, as Lisa said, is to back up a little bit and get away from the day-to-day -day and give you uh, an overview of how we got to where we got. Where have we been, where are we, and where are we going as a homeowner's insurance industry here in Florida? And for those of you who come from outside of Florida, I'm sorry. Uh, but my company uh, has 230,000 customers in Florida. We only do homeowner's insurance. And so for us, it's about Florida all the time, every day. Um, you start out with Hurricane Andrew, August 24th, 1992. This is the day that changed our business forever. Initially, the uh, insurance industry said, hey, it's no big deal. What's in Homestead? an Air Force base, some mobile homes, and some farms, okay? In 1989, we'd had Hurricane Hugo hit Charleston. Now that's a big deal. Well, the first thing that I did was go to Homestead with Governor Childs, and we went to Homestead Air Force Base. And I'll tell you the two things that I remember. We were being uh, taken around the Air Force Base by a colonel, and I looked up at the uh, control tower. And 30 feet off the ground, there was a big hole that went all the way through the control tower. And I said, Colonel, what made the hole? And he looked at me, stone cold, serious, and said, a Volkswagen. And you go, wow, that's really something. And then he took us. To the end of the runway, they had left uh, five servicemen on the base. They'd evacuated all the planes, but they had five men who stayed there during the storm. And they were in a building built to military construction standards to withstand sustained winds of 165 miles an hour. And that building came down around their ears. And the only reason those five people survived was because they hung out in the stairwell. You can't imagine the uh, destruction. 165 mile an hour sustained winds, 190 miles an hour or more gusts, 43 deaths, 100,000 homes damaged, hundreds of thousands of people forced to evacuate or, or to move, um, 35 million tons of debris, okay? $10 billion of uh, losses reported by the homeowners insurance companies in Florida. Uh, construction fraud. There was over 6,000 claims and, uh, of construction fraud, and over 1,000 people were convicted of committing construction fraud. And 11 insurance companies went solvent. It was a really, really big deal. And who was writing the business? Well, some names you recognize, State Farm, Allstate. Uh, the big guys had 80% of the market. Domestic insurance companies like mine only had 4% of the market. And there's some names on there that might surprise you. Geico. Who knew that Geico wrote homeowner's insurance in Florida? They got out of the homeowner's business in 1996, as did some of those other folks. Um, and they are still leaving Florida. If you look at the top 10 writers of homeowners insurance in the United States, 60% of it is written by the top 10 companies, the household names. 
their market share has gone uh, down to where it is only 15%. So that's the difference between everywhere else and Florida. 60% of the market in the states outside of Florida, 15% in Florida, and those folks are never coming back. Um, you look at the, what's happened in Florida with the growth. We had uh, $870 billion in TIB in 1993 and over three trillion today. Uh, the big problem that we have is if we, if we had a hurricane hit Miami, a big one, two and a half million residential claims. You all ready for that? Two and a half million? Oh, and that doesn't include the auto and flood. How many of your companies are ready for that? Good luck. Um, the residual market basically didn't exist. We had one entity called FUA, Florida Windstorm Underwriting Association, based right here in Jacksonville. And it was originally formed to write windstorm insurance in the Keys. And it for expanded a little while. And it only was, has within 20, was in 23 counties uh, right before Hurricane Andrew. And guess what? It didn't write any business in Dade, Broward, or Palm Beach County. What happened was FUA, and then we created the, what's called the FRPCJUA, and that merged into what's now known as Citizens. And what I'm going to do in this presentation is talk about all of this together as a lump as the residual market. And look what happened. 61,000 policies in the residual market in FUA before Hurricane Andrew ballooned to 1.4 million policies in 96, went down to 500,000 in 2001. Then we had the storms of 2004 and the insolvency of the pole companies, and we peaked out at 1,418,000 policies in the uh, residual market. Now we're on a downward track, 566,000. In terms of TIV, uh, we had a, a little bit different change. Uh, the, t the TIV didn't go down quite as fast because um, the people taking business out of the residual market weren't stupid. Um, they took out the smaller value policies and the ones that were less exposed to risk. But we're down to 202 billion of uh, TIV in the residual market, which is really uh, less than 10% of the uh, TIV in the state. Um, what was our legislative response? Well, as Lisa said, there were really only two people in the Senate who could spell insurance. Uh, Senator Pat Thomas was a local agent in Quincy, Florida, great guy, former head of the uh, Democratic Party, and I was uh, in the reinsurance business. I started in the reinsurance business uh, before most of you were born in 1974 and um, had been in the insurance and reinsurance business and I'm still in it 41 years later. Um, too stupid to do anything else, I guess. Uh, on the House side, Representative John Cosgrove took the lead. He lived uh, in the southern part of Miami near Homestead, and he lived through the uh, hurricane, and that made a huge impression on him. Uh, he had to ride out the hurricane in his bathtub. Uh, so what do we do? And, and, and as we go through this presentation, I want you to think about the overriding questions the ones we had to think about. Should the government be involved in the homeowner's insurance business? That's the first question. The second question is, if they are involved, how should they be involved? What's the size and scope of that involvement? And then the third question was, who should pay the bill? Should it be the folks on the beach in Miami or all of us, because we're all in this together? Or what, how do you balance that? And the last question is, when do you pay? And by that I mean, in the insurance business, you pay in advance and then the insurance company reimburses you for your claim. We haven't done it that way. A lot of our claims paying capacity is gonna be funded after the loss. So those are the questions that we were dealing with and we've been dealing with for the last 27 years. Um, the first thing that happened after Hurricane Andrew is Tom Gallagher, did some things that were probably unconstitutional, but nobody called him on it. He, he immediately said, you can't uh, cancel any policies, you can't make any rate filings. He froze the market. Uh, and then he started looking at the uh, 
financial impact of Hurricane Andrew on the companies. Okay, he and I went to New York City, uh, and it was really kind of uh, fun uh, because when you fly up in the state plane and you get off with the insurance commissioner and you walk into a meeting of a whole bunch of reinsurance executives, all the presidents of the company, and uh, a number of them didn't know that I was elected to the Senate because it only happened a year before, and one of them said, Locke, what are you doing here? Do you work for Commissioner Gallagher? And Gallagher turned around and said, well, no, actually, uh, he, I kind of work for him. And everybody went, whoa, okay. And then all those people wanted to talk about was the impact of Hurricane Andrew on commercial insurers. And I said, gentlemen, time out. You need to understand something that's very important. Commissioner Gallagher is elected by the people of Florida. They vote for him every couple of years. I'm elected by the 400,000 people in my district. So let's talk about what's going to happen to our constituents. After we sort that out, then we can talk about your problem. And one of the mistakes that people make in Tallahassee in talking about their problems is legislatures often don't care about your problems. What they care about is their constituents' problem. And how does your problem impact their constituent either for good or for ill? Um, what we had to do, we went into special session in December, and the first thing we had to do was pay the claims. We had to borrow $500 million, which had never been done before, to pay uh, the thousands of people who were pounding uh, on the insurance department's door saying, I need money uh, to pay for the insolvent companies that couldn't pay it. Um, and we had to increase FIGA's assessment from 2% to 4%. We had to create a market called the FRPCJUA because companies weren't writing more business. They were trying to get out of here. Um, we had to uh, do some things. We made price gouging illegal. And, you know, typical um, people crawling around uh, the, the uh, destruction in Hurricane uh, Andrew were uh, robbing stuff, but the technical definition of burglary didn't apply because it wasn't a complete structure. So we had to change the definition of burglary and theft uh, to make it a crime. We then uh, did a couple of things uh, in the years following that, 93 to 95, we created the Florida Hurricane Catastrophe Fund. So the government of Florida went in to the reinsurance business because reinsurers didn't want to provide us with the capacity that we need. And uh, one of the things that was being developed at the time was hurricane catastrophe models. We didn't trust those guys. We said this is a scheme by the insurance industry to raise prices. So we created a commission to look at the computer models and evaluate them to make sure that they were on the up and up. Um, but we did extend the moratorium on cancellation, so we made it very difficult to get out of Florida unless you went to the uh, Department of Insurance with an exposure reduction plan. Um, the reason that the FRPCJUA exploded from nothing to a million policies was because of the rate standard. And one of the things that you learn when you're in the legislature, is you can take a lot of care to write something, but the way it's implemented has absolutely nothing to do with what you intended. And uh, I wrote a lot of the law that created the FRPCJUA, and we said it's supposed to be a market of last resort, it's supposed to be a market where people in good faith who can't find coverage can find coverage, and we said we want FRPCJUAs to be the highest in the land but we had uh, a standard which was subjective. We just said it has to be actuarially sound, and it has to include an adequate cat load. Well, the actuaries, of course, said nobody files loss costs. We don't know what an actuarially sound uh, cat load is. So they came up. They were the lowest rates in the land. So people went there to buy insurance. No problem. So we had to change the law to, to what we call a top 20, where the FRPC JUA had to charge more than the 20 highest, uh, biggest riders in their area. It was an objective standard. And 
we required policyholders to accept a takeout offer no matter what the price. So that was what started the downward slope of the FRPCJUA. Um, but when we allowed the FRPCJUA to pay bonuses, there was a problem. If you were a new company, the, the mortgage uh, industry inserted this language into the bill. The bonus doesn't count unless you replace it with a policy that meets the requirements of the secondary mortgage market. That was a very clever way of saying your company had to be rated by AM Best. And AM Best wanted nothing to do with Florida startup companies. So fortunately, a company called Demotech came in, a guy named Joe Petrelli. And he said, I'll help you guys out. Um, he had been approved by HUD in 1989, so a Demotech rating qualified for the secondary mortgage markets. Okay, without him, um, we would not have had a depopulation program, and a lot of the Florida companies would not exist. Uh, there were 17 new companies created in Florida from 1995 to 2000, and look at how little money you had to put on the table to get in the business. Seven million bucks. Um, and a lot of them didn't make it. Only seven are still alive. So 40% made it. 60% uh, didn't. Um, there was a bunch of different takeout programs that took out almost a million policies from the uh, RPCJUA. But there were some other responses which were uh, just as, uh, as interesting from the market. Um, look at the change in the perils. Uh, additional living expense used to be unlimited. Uh, Schedule B coverage was reduced. Deductibles were increased. And guaranteed replacement cost went away. Since a lot of you are claim folks, you'll get a kick out of this story. Um, my senior vice president of claims at the time was an insured of one of the major carriers. And he came raging into my office. And he said, I thought you told me that you prohibited policy cancellations. And I said, absolutely. And he said, well, look at this cover. This is the coverage I had. This is the coverage I got now. It's not the same policy. And I said, well, under Florida law, it is. But that was a significant change, redu uh, re reduction in, in coverage. Um, some of the big carriers uh, changed the way they do business. Uh, the nationwide guys all became independent. Um, and other companies developed uh, alternative ways of selling uh, homeowners insurance. Allstate calls it expanded markets. Um, they, uh, USAA writes business through non-affiliated carriers through an MGA. So they, they figured out a way to, uh, to write business even though they weren't doing it. Another thing that happened, pup companies were created. Uh, the big carriers tried to wall off their liability. And so travelers, Allstate, State Farm, and Nationwide created pups. Um, Hurricane Andrew created a new industry called computer modeling. There was a, a gentleman named uh, Don Friedman who worked at the Travelers. Nobody paid any attention to him, even Travelers. Uh, it wasn't until after Hurricane Andrew that people said, oh, we've got a problem. Because the only thing they kept track of prior to Hurricane Andrew was premium and market share. They didn't keep track of TIV or location. I mean, the old Sanborn maps had gone away. And uh, so all of a sudden, uh, that became uh, a big deal. It's a huge industry now. And in fact, the state of Florida created its own computer model. Because again, we didn't trust those guys. So we said, good, everybody has a computer model. We'll have one. So we spent a couple of million bucks. And Florida International gave us our own computer model that uh, is another way to keep the computer modelers uh, um, honest. Now, one thing, though, is, is that is a, a, a misconception in the public, and even a lot of insurance people, is they think this is an exact science, computer modeling. Let me tell you, it's not. Um, this is our book of business, and you can see that if we believe EQE, our 100-year storm is 421 million. Uh, if we believe RMS, it's 774 million. Oh, that's only a difference of 84%. Okay? Um, 
And all of these models are approved by the Florida Hurricane Methodology Commission. But they have, in many cases, very, very different results. That's the same book of business, same data, same date. And you get those kind of results. But there's another way of looking at what could happen in Florida. And that's called a deterministic model. This is Karen Clark's latest model. And for those of you who don't understand uh, PML, look at that line. The line there is the, the PML in Florida, which is about 100 billion. Well, that's kind of the average depth of a lake. So you could be somebody who drowns in a lake that's three feet deep because you just happen to step in the hole that's 12 feet deep. And what PML means is, in the 100-year event, is there is a 1% chance that a storm will cause damage which is greater than that number. And what they don't tell you and what the press doesn't tell you is that many times it could be a lot greater. And what a deterministic model does is it takes a 100-year meteorological event and it marches it around the Florida coast. And you can see, worst case scenario, something coming in in Miami. Uh, you're looking on the order of 300 billion of insured losses. Um, by 2002, the market had really stabilized. And the legislature had capped the liability of the CAT fund at 11 billion. We'd frozen the boundaries of the wind pool and we mandated a reduction in the PML. Um, but there were some things on the horizon which caused concern. Uh, sinkholes, okay, in 2002, I was driving around Florida running for attorney general and I would drive up I-75 and something really scared me. I would see a big billboard with a really nice looking man on it saying, got a problem with a sinkhole? Call sinkholejustice.com. Another one, same thing, different guy, got a problem? Call sinkholelaw.com. And I said, oh, why would anybody want to do business north of Tampa when these guys are looking for sinkhole claims? And we never did. Um, but then we had 2004 and 2005, huge number of claims, $50 billion in losses. Um, we had multiple insolvencies. Uh, it took a while for some of these companies to go insolvent because it took a while for the claims to, to be reported and be developed. Um, we made additional changes in coverage. Um, the big one was screen enclosures. Uh, the Poe insolvency, pay, the Poe companies paid about 2.1 billion in claims. One third of that was screen enclosures. As most of you probably know, is when the wind goes over 90 miles an hour, screen enclosure is gone. And uh, the inflation of trying to get it replaced uh, is just a huge amount of money. Um, so then how do we rebuild the industry? Well, one of the things we felt was that the industry needed more capital. And uh, Senator J.D. Alexander, who was chairman of appropriations, uh, approached me and said, what do you think? I said, well, uh, that's probably a good idea. Now, what J.D. wanted, he wanted big companies and he wanted a firm commitment to right business. And he wanted, uh, he was going to appropriate $500 million. And I said, J.D., that's, that, you don't need to do that much. That's a lot. So what we came up with was a $250 million program of matching money where investors had to match, a minimum, a minimum investment by investors was 25 million. The state would match them with 25 million as a loan paid back over 20 years. The only problem we had was selling it to Governor Bush. And um, I knew that Governor Bush walked home every night from the governor's office to the Capitol, I mean, to the, from the governor's office to his house, the, the mansion. So one afternoon when he's walking home, I ambushed him, and I told him about this program. And uh, his initial reaction was it was either communism or socialism or 
something. He really, really wasn't excited about it. But we eventually changed his mind. It was passed. It was signed. And the 13 companies that applied are, in many cases, the ones that are here today writing a majority of the business in the state of Florida. Um, then we had another hurricane, Charlie, OK? Um, and he's a really nice guy. Uh, he, I know him real well. I served with him in the Senate. I ran against him as a, uh, for attorney general. And the best thing that ever happened to me is he beat me like a drum. Uh, but you know, um, he really isn't what I'd call a policy wonk. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he thought that the government role in the insurance business should be expanded a lot. And he thought that citizens should go from being a market of last resort to a market of first resort. And so uh, we expanded citizens. He froze the rates. Citizens' rates were frozen from 2005 to 2009. Um, the CAT fund, he increased the capacity by $19 billion, OK? Um, and Senator Steve Geller wanted to sell that capacity to the domestic industry for free, <laughs> OK, for free. Um, and this is what happened. We went from $15 billion in liability, this is just in the CAT fund, to $35 billion. Uh, we couldn't pay that bill. And, and I went to London about this time and, and met with a senior executive of one of the big syndicates at Lloyd's. And he said, son, your cat fund has a problem. I said, what's that? He said, it's broke. And I said, well, let me tell you something. When you have the ability to tax 20 million people, you're never broke. Now, you might be short of cash, but you're never broke. Um, fortunately, uh, that bill didn't get, get called in. Um, we got a new governor, Governor Scott. Uh, I met with him. John Auer and I met with him right after he took office. And uh, you know, when you meet with a governor, you've only got a certain amount of time, and you script out what you're supposed to say and who's going to do. Well, the governor blew that right up. He walked in, he looked at me, and he said, Senator, why didn't you solve this problem when you were here? And I said, well, actually, Governor, I did. We increased citizens' rates. We um, made people have to accept a takeout offer from a private company. And we paid private companies to uh, take policies out of citizens. And the, the policy count went from 900,000 down to 100,000. I said, it's really pretty simple. Um, he goes, hmm, OK. Uh, well, we did do some things. We restricted citizens' coverage. We created a clearinghouse. And this was important because prior to this time, once you were in citizens, you had permanent eligibility. You could turn down an offer of coverage, which was even less than the citizens' price. Um, so we changed that. We, we tried to get after the sinkhole uh, problem. And we said, look, if you've got a house over a million dollars, you don't need our help. Um, you can go into the private market. Um, and look at what happened, OK? We, we started to reduce citizens' model loss from $25 billion down to, down to $17 billion. So we were going in the right way. Um, and this is what's called the total assessable shortfall. It, it's a report that's written uh, every year. And what it tries to do is quantify how much the citizens of Florida would be on the hook for in the event of a 100-year storm. And the peak was, was $36 billion. And let me tell you why this is important. Because people don't know how much they're on the hook for. Uh, one of my constituents called me up. He had gotten a bill uh, from one of the, the hurricanes in, uh, well, actually, it was, it was in 97. Um, and the conversation started out. Who is the communist that voted for this tax? And it went downhill from there. And it turned out that his assessment was less than 10 bucks. And I said, I'm thinking, this guy doesn't know what we've done with him. 
But we're going in the right direction. Uh, the assessable shortfall is down to $3 billion, and actually I think it's going to go away because the CAT fund bought a billion dollars worth of reinsurance, and uh, uh, Citizens has bought an extra billion. So it's probably going into this hurricane zero, which is good news for the taxpayers. Um, what are we looking like today? These are slides that are put together by uh, Dowling and Company, and they show uh, the market. And what you can see is the total premium dollars uh, peaked at 10.2 billion in 2007, and they uh, went back up. Uh, you know, they went way down because of wind mitigation credits and uh, the CAT fund, and then they creep back up to 10.1. And actually, in 2014, the total market went down, um, and they break down the market. They call the ants. That's all state, nationwide travelers, and State Farm. The specialists, that's people like me. The national companies, USAA and AIG and Liberty Mutual, and then citizens. And uh, this in, is in terms of percentage. And you can see that the domestic market, the specialists, now have 60% of the market in Florida. So the difference between prior to Hurricane Andrew, we had 4%, now we have 60%. It's a huge change. Um, look at the average premium. You see this a lot in the paper in Florida, uh, you, how it's gone up. Um, but again, December 14, it actually went down, 2,119. Um, even more incredible is look at the rate. Okay, who would believe that the people in Florida are paying less rate, significantly less, than they were in March of 07? gone from 0.57% down to 0.46. That's a 20% decrease in the rate per thousand. Um, what does a future hold? Well, the good news for you, you guys are gonna have a job for a long time. Your job can't be outsourced. Uh, it can't be sent to India or somewhere else. 50% um, of our claims uh, are water, water related. And I just got the numbers from citizens for 2014. 59% of citizens' claims in the PLA account are water. Okay, so water's a big deal. Um, but um, technology is going to be at work in your industry. Uh, this is a new water heater that's um, first digital water heater. It doesn't have a, a heating element in it. It's going to be available in 400 Lowe's stores around the country before the end of the year. Um, so you are going to see some technology changes in the, in the water business. Um, we do know that a, a hurricane is going to hit Florida again. We don't know when. We've been real lucky for the last nine years. Um, the good news is we're really better prepared because of Hurricane Andrew. We have done some stuff that no other state has done. Our nursing homes and hospitals are required to have contingency plans where they can take each of their patients and put them into two separate locations. We have bridges that we, one person can now close down the bridges to help people evacuate. Same thing with toll roads. We can eliminate the tolls, get all the toll roads going one way. Um, generators are required uh, at a lot of uh, emergency operation centers and at gas stations. So we've done, we've, Hurricane Andrew and the ones that followed put us in as good a shape as we can be to meet the next hurricane. Now, what's the difference? Another story. Okay. Hurricane Katrina is getting ready to strike. Jeb Bush calls Haley Barber, the governor of Mississippi, and Mrs. Uh, LeBlanco, the head, the head of uh, Louisiana, and talks to him about what you ought to do, how things you ought to get ready, blah, blah, blah. He comes into the lieutenant governor's office and says, those people don't have a clue as to what is going to hit them. And we know they didn't, and we know it was a mess. Um, our state, uh, fortunately, is in a lot better shape. Um, one of the questions that I think all of you should ask is, are your employees prepared for a hurricane? Um, I happened to be in Santiago, Cuba, when Hurricane Han Sandy hit. And that's when it was a real hurricane, not a superstorm. 
I was there with uh, my wife, she's director of a museum, and we, we were there. We thought it was only going to be a tropical storm, but it, it picked up a lot of steam between Jamaica and Cuba. Um, that hotel where we were staying was built in 1991, a Spanish hotel, probably the strongest building in uh, Santiago, Cuba. Windows blown out, you can see that that was the, the lobby. The place was destroyed. But what really impressed me was the employees hung in there, okay? They, they didn't have a kitchen, but they, they managed to get us in the morning, get us some sandwiches and some coffee. And uh, the maid who took care of our room showed up in her starch uniform with her shop vac, because we had about an inch of water in our room. And we, in our little broken Spanish, we said, well, how did you, how did you make it? Because there was like 25 people killed in Santiago and 20,000 homes destroyed. And she said, well, um, I have three kids. The roof blew off our house, but, but the kids are being taken care of by my mom. Uh, and you know, I'm here to do my job. That really impressed me as a, as a service business. So what we've done at Security First is every single one of our employees every year has to sit down with our manager of cat response and our human resources people and update a personal disaster recovery plan because we have made it very clear to our employees that that's when our customers are going to need you when there's a hurricane and we expect you to be at work. Now, if you have a problem, okay, you have kids that need to be taken care of, sent to your mom in North Carolina or whatever. Let's talk through the problems because we don't want you worried about your family. We want your family taken care of and we'll help you do that. But when disaster strikes, we want to be there uh, for our customers and having you there is the only way that we're going to do it. We've talked to some of the other speakers, have talked a little bit about mobile. Um, I don't think uh, many people in the insurance industry really fully appreciate the revolution that's coming. People expect the Amazonian experience. Look at the last bullet. Three out of four Americans expect help within three hours of posting a request on social media. Raise your hand if your company could do that. Ask the question, what would happen at your company if tomorrow you got a thousand emails with four pictures attached describing the damage? What would happen if you got a post on Facebook because, um, or you got a text because the cell phone tower was down and all they could do was text you? What would you do? What would your company do? Well, there is an answer to that question. We worked with a company in uh, uh, England to develop a social media response that takes all of that stuff and sends a response, gets into our, our system, and, and gets the workflow flowing. And we did that in 2009, 2010. We got an IBM Smarter Commerce Award for doing it. And let me give you an example of what it does. Uh, Walt Zender here is head of our claim department. Um, midnight, Saturday night, we had a very unhappy customer who posted a very nasty post on Facebook. As soon as that happened, because what, what happens, we have IBM Content Analytics and Watson reading all that stuff 24-7. As soon as that happened, we knew we had a problem, and an email went to Walt so that when he got up Sunday morning, boom, he could read an email. He contacted the customer. He solved the problem. And by 5 o'clock Sunday afternoon, the post had been changed on Facebook from an unhappy customer to a happy customer. That's where the world is going. And um, I think the technology change is going to be picking up rather than slowing down. Um, you've talked a little bit about big data. Uh, this is some of the, there's really two kinds of big data. Structured data, which is house characteristics, for example. There's also unstructured data, which is 
file information or telephone calls. And computers now can read that, can uh, analyze it by content and by tone, and can put it into your workflow and tell you which, which you ought to work on first and can spot trends, whether it's fraud or other things, that you really can't do with people because you can't have enough people to read absolutely everything 24-7. Um, what about drones? We've stayed away from drones. And uh, here's why. I think that the average person believes that when they are in their backyard, they have a right to privacy. Now, legally, that's not true. Airplane can fly over, um, look down in your house, look at what you're doing in your backyard. You don't have a, a right to privacy, but people believe that they do. And I think that if insurance companies use drones uh, to do routine underwriting, uh, that kind of thing, there's going to be a pushback from the public. We, we had a bill passed the legislature this year, which made it clear that it was a crime for a drone to fly over uh, a house and take pictures, uh, un unless, and I haven't studied the language, un unless it was from an entity who was licensed to do what they were doing, whatever, whatever that means. Uh, yeah, okay, the, the realtors. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think, now, in a disaster situation, if, if, you're, if you're doing for disaster recovery or for deploying your, your claim resources, uh, I think the, the public would buy that. I personally think that the best thing that the industry could do is have a joint venture with emergency management people to, to do a survey where, where, every, where everybody got the, you know, got the same results at the same time. I mean, maybe every spring fly over Florida, take a picture of all the houses, and then fly over after a disaster so you could quickly say, well, here's the ones that are damaged, here's the ones that we work on first. And if you, if you did that as a public-private partnership, I think the, uh, the customers would accept that and they could understand why. That's very different than Security First Insurance Company flying over my house spying on me. Um, Google. Google's been in the uh, paper a lot. And um, what's been talked about in the paper is Google Compare. Oh, is this going to put agents out of business? Uh, or, you know, what's, well, there's been comparative sites around for a long time. Um, what's going to change the business is not the comparative website. It's the car. Look at that car. It drives itself. Now look at this slide. What do you see? The amount of money that the average family spends on auto insurance is going down, okay? The amount of money that they spend on homeowners insurance is going up. The lines crossed, what, 2007? On a relative basis, car safety, um, enforcement of drunk driving, uh, airbags, has reduced the, the automobile business by a lot. I, somebody said it was equivalent to a company the size of Geico disappearing. That's what's happened in the last couple of years. Rates would go down faster if the bans on texting were enforced. And, and it's conceivable to me that the wide adoption of driverless cars or even cars that have safety features like you can buy now where they stay in the lane, they automatically brake, is going to drive loss costs down. So the auto number is going to continue to go down. And the people that it's going to hurt is the agents. Because a lot of agents that I know survive on their auto renewals. And ask one of the agents, what would happen if the auto premium in your office went down by 30%, they'd say, I'd be out of business. Um, but the good news for companies that do what I do, which is write homeowners insurance, 
we're now the bell of the ball. Uh, look at the, the, the price is going up, we're making money. Uh, so all of a sudden, everybody wants to talk to us. Um, it does make a difference what happens in Tallahassee. I hope I've shown you how that change over the last 25 years has gone by answering those questions in different ways. Should the government be involved? How should they be involved? Who should pay? When, when they should pay? That's gone back and forth. And it's going to continue to go, go back and forth. Um, this is what Teddy Roosevelt said. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. Now, I've been in the arena. And as a senator, I can tell you that there are 2,000 bills filed in the Florida Senate every year. Every one of those bills is important to somebody. And you can be the hardest working individual and the fastest reader and the smartest person in the room, and there's no way that you can read 2,000 bills. And 800 of those get to the floor, and in a normal year, 400 of them become law. So what you do when you're in a legislative body is you look for people who are the lead on your issue, whether it's saving the whales, protecting kids, criminal justice, or insurance. And you, tr you try to hope that you have somebody who is articulate, who can talk to your issue, and you try to encourage them. And one of the things that term limits has done is it has taken away a lot of the expertise on individual issues in the Florida legislature. But when you're talking to a legislator, as I told the people in New York in 1992, I don't care what happens to corporations. Corporations don't vote. What you have to be able to explain in simple English to a legislator is why he should care. Why does this make a difference to his constituents? And it's really important for people who work in the real world every day to make a contribution, to make the effort to be involved in one way or another. Because Lisa's a wonderful lobbyist, but she's there every week. Okay. What doesn't happen is real live people coming up and saying, this is my problem, this is why it's a problem, and this is why I think it's good public policy for you to do something. Now, fortunately, Bubba uh, takes a little different approach. Uh, he was there. He was in the arena. Uh, he fought the good fight. I'm sure he'll be, a, be there next year. But I would encourage you to follow his example. Get involved because it does make a difference. And um, the colloquial way of saying it is you want to be at the table because if you're not at the table, you could be on the menu. Thank you.